Hello everyone, just a brief note that this podcast will contain spoilers for The Silmarillion, The Lord of the Rings, and The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien, as well as tangential references and spoilers to all published books in George R.R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire. Also, there are brief spoilers for Dune by Frank Herbert and the film The Hobbit, The Battle of Five Armies. This is also the Vassals of King's Grey Valentine's Day episode, where we cover Baron and Luthien, the power couple of Tolkien's world, and we try to keep it Valentine's Day related for at least part of the after show. For those of you who haven't listened to our previous Silmarillion recaps, they are episodes 147, 155, 163, and 172. Thank you and enjoy. I love uh, Tedard's pronunciation of Kothira. Uh, I can't even say it. Kothira. Um, you got to do the <laughs> on the Hakara. <laughs> 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 Who is she? This woman you sing of. Tis the lay of Luthien, the elf maiden who gave her love to Beren, a mortal. What happened to her? She died. Hello everyone, welcome to Vassals of Kingsgrave. This is going to be the fifth recording of the Silmarillion crew. Today we're going to be just discussing chapter 19 of the Quintus Silmarillion, which is the tale of Baron and Luthien. And joining me today we have four other vassals. My name is Greg, I'm Claudius the Fool on the forums, and joining me are... Um, Alex, I go by as Ali Wendio on the forums. This is Matt Varley on the forums. This is uh, Mathieu Barrick on the forums. And this is uh, Eddie Tedard on the forums. Okay, so we're glad to have Eddie here, one of the holdovers from the uh, Lord of the Rings reviews. So we basically divided this one chapter into six individual sections, because it is about 50 pages in the book, um, and we didn't want to do one giant summary. Basically, this is the tale of Baron and Luthien. It's this amazing love story that we've been told about through, you know, Aragorn and Arwen are mentioned in comparison to it in Lord of the Rings. And it seems to be, you know, this amazing love story that happened in ages past. And now we, this is our first chance of us actually, you know, hearing the tale of it as it's being, as it's happened. Uh, just to put this in perspective, this chapter starts pretty much uh, maybe a couple years after the Dagger Bragalock, which was the Battle of Sudden Flame. And basically all of the, or most of the, um, the Noldor and the men in the north were, were destroyed or overrun or had to retreat. And Barahir, who was uh, one of the commanders of the of the Houses of Men. So uh, the first section of the story, I'll do a little recap and then we'll have our discussion. After after the Dagger Bragalock and the ruin of Dorthonian, only Barahir and his twelve companions remain to fight a guerrilla war against Morgoth and his army of orcs. They hide out by a lake called Tarn Aelwyn. Morgoth is constantly searching for them but has no success, so he uses his underling Sauron to use uh, his sorcery to trick one of Barahir's men named Gorlim into thinking that his wife is still alive and that he will reunite him with her if he gives up Barahir's location. After being tortured, Gorlim agrees to give up the location. He expects to be reunited with his wife, but Sauron is a deceiver and he kills Gorlim, uh, but Technically, he's being honest because she's dead, and now he's dead, so he reunited them together. Um, so Sauron is telling the truth. Uh, Morgoth sends a force of orcs to Tarn Elowen and kills Barahir and all his men, except his son Baron, who was away from the camp at the time of the attack. Uh, the orcs cut off Barahir's hand with the ring of Felagund on it, and are all happy and celebrating. Uh, Baron then sees this happening, and in a rage, he attacks them, kills the captain of the orcs, takes his father's hand that has the ring on it, um, and he escapes before the orcs can manage to regroup. So that's kind of the first little action sequence in uh, in this in this tale. Didn't know Sauron was playing semantics so well. Um, <laughs> like, uh, I'm gonna reunite you. Psych. Um, <laughs> but, it um, sounds like um, standard um, supervillain logic. Yeah, it's like mm, we shall kill you by leaving you on this island with sharks with laser beams on their heads. So, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's never really explained how what how Sauron actually has. Like, you know, he can basically do anything that the writer wants him to do. It's still, I mean, it's still awesome because it's it's. Uh, I mean, I, that's why I like it when it's not explained in in detail because it's just like yeah, magic is allowed to happen. You can't ever understand it fully anyway, so there's no point in having it have any any 
like strict rules. Right. So, no, you know. I, I kind of like that it is more subtle that way. Tolkien kind of does that a lot. Like he very rarely gets down to the specific level. You know, when when actions happen, he's he's always one or two steps removed from 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 the specifics. Even like with the battle scenes and stuff. That that's kind of his thing. But uh, yeah, Sauron. He's really subtle, and he's really kind of I don't know. It's kind of different from the Sauron that we see in, in Lord of the Rings, where he's very heavy-handed in a lot of what he does. But uh, I kind of like how he's trying to be, like, he thinks he's being clever by, I'll reunite you with your wife, which, of course, he, he does, but, you know, spoiler yeah. alert, she's dead. Well, he's mm-hmm. actually actively taking part in something, right? He's physical, so mm-hmm. he's not actually uh, just a presence. He's he's really uh, a person a person living in this, a physical person living. I, I guess that's why he's so so talkative as well, because that's the most we hear. I mean, we, we don't actually hear Th- Sauron talk in The Lord of the Rings, so... Right, he's just an eye in Lord of the Rings. I was just going to say, I like um, Sauron's little deceit when he shows... Um, Barry here, the image of his wife in his house, because Barry here like knows that the place is besieged by uh, the orcs and Sauron, and he just looks at his house from afar because he's still hoping that his wife is going to come back, and he sees his wife in his house, and he's like, "Oh, she's still alive," and he doesn't even go inside, and then he gets uh, attacked by the orcs, yeah. and it wasn't even his wife; it was just Sauron. Yeah, I think you, I think you mean Gorlim. Gorlim is the guy who he, yeah. who he tricks. Or Gorlim, yeah. Yeah, like sorry. seeing the light blow out, and then then he's you know. Do you set think up, it might not be? New, do you think it might not be me? An image? It might be just Sauron in a dress. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a magnificent scene, right? Uh, from, it's like from from the uh, uh, Sleeping Beauty, where the prince gets into into the cabin and is ambushed, right? Uh, it's like that kind of it's like that kind of thing. I always uh, thought of it more of that scene in uh, Spaceballs where Rick Moranis is just like fooled you. <laughs> well, yeah, I kept trying to remember. Like, I feel like I've seen this exact thing in in a myth or a, you know a story that I read at some point, but I couldn't f- of of the guy telling him that oh you'll be reunited with your wife, but and then they kill him, but they're dead. Or it, it might have been when I read the Silmarillions ten years ago <laughs> that reminded me of right. it. But does anyone else like think this is exactly from something else? <laughs> Just a quick note, I'm butting in post-recording here, that after we recorded, I remembered exactly what I was thinking about. It was from Dune, where Baron Harkonnen convinces Dr. Yui to betray the Atreides because he claims to have his wife, and he'll reunite them if he helps him. And then when he does, he kills him because she's dead, and he reunites them together because they're both dead. Back to the recording. Thank you. Uh, yeah, but this basically sets Baron off on his, you know, on his lonesome, and he's gonna, of course, get into more trouble before it gets better. Uh, did you have a question about wraiths uh, down on the notes here? Oh yeah, the the ghost where um, at one point, oh, I don't know if that's in this. Uh, it's happening soon anyway. Where the Gorlim's wraith appears to Baron and tells him what happened. I, I'm trying to think. Like, is this the first time that we've seen an actual ghost aside from like the ring wraiths? You know. Yeah. It, um, I I was listening to the audio book today, so that that was actually in his dream. So he was having a prophetic dream, and he saw oh, okay. the ghost of. Yeah, that's, that's it. Mm, that's I took it as well, right? It's it's uh it's it seems like well it would be it would seem strange that we only get like a visitation once in in the whole story. Uh, this this I mean appearing in a dream seems much more logical. Okay, so I guess technically you didn't see them then. I'll take it. That's fine. Okay, yeah, I think we're good to go on to the second part. Okay, Baron continues to wander in Dorthonian. He becomes a vegetarian. I missed that part apparently. <laughs> Um, continues to kill as many of Morgoth's forces as he can. Eventually, Morgoth gets fed up and has Sauron attack Baron, uh, and has Sauron attack Baron in forests with an army of werewolves. Baron is forced to flee Dorthonian. I'll never get that right. And he heads south over the mountains of terror into the valley of dreadful death. So only good things from here on out. He survives unnamed terrors and creatures that nearly break him, but somehow, against all fate, he finds his way past the girdle of Melian and into the kingdom of Doriath. While wandering the forest of Neldoreth, he sees Luthien, daughter, daughter of King <sighs> Thingol, and Queen Melian dancing in the moonlight. He falls under a spell and passes out, I think, for several months. And there's a lot of swooning and dreamy wakefulness until Luthien hears his calling out to her, calling her to Nuviel, which means Nightingale. Then she comes to him, they fall madly in love, but she runs away again. Burns swoons again and wakes alone. Luthien later returns and they declare their love for each other. Then they hang out in the forest for a few months before the minstrel Daron, who also loves Luthien, 
spies on them and reports them back to Thingol. Luthien says she won't talk to her father unless she swear unless he swears not to kill Baron. Thingol reluctantly agrees, and Baron is brought before Thingol, who is furious and angry at Baron because he's mortal and he dared to come into his house. His house. Baron is initially cowed by Thingol, but he gains strength from Luthien and declares his love for her openly. Thingol regrets his promise not to kill Baron. Thingol continues to demean Baron until he has enough, shows everyone the ring of Felagund, and everybody shuts off. Baron says that he wants to marry Luthien. Thingol says, kind of jokingly, that he can marry Luthien when he brings back a Silmaril from Morgoth's crown back to Thingol. Baron says that's it, and he agrees to do it. Melian is pissed at Thingol that he has doomed either himself or his daughter. Luthien swears never to sing again. Oh, no. <laughs> Whatever shall we do? Thingol but, um, continuing to to do the Dicky Thingol thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I know. Like, I said this like that's... way back when that he's just like the worst king. Like, ugh. yeah. I guess they. Based... He sounds like the worst husband as well. He never listens to his wife. Right. Well, they've been married for what two thousand years at this point. So like they've said everything that needs to be said, and they're kind of just going through the motions at this point. Yeah. Or is it just go like morning? Yeah. <laughs> Evening. They don't even have to, to talk. Get... They just stare at each other and it's They're like staying Hello. together for the children. Didn't Thingo swear to spare the person? I mean, he didn't know that about Baron at this point. I mean, he just swore that he wouldn't kill the person who who she met, but he wasn't aware that it was Baron at this point. And that he was human, so um, once they found him, that that once he came before him, that's when when he found out. But at the same time. Um, I think like he wouldn't have he he said he said it himself right that like, he wouldn't have sworn it if it, if he had known before right right but he but he did so he stuck with it but he's trying to get around it anyway because he he's sending Baron away thinking well even if he does make it back he he's not gonna have what I he's not gonna have my daughter anyway so it's like yeah I was just gonna say didn't like Melian like mind meld Baron when he was like talking to Thingol like is, isn't still, there something. She doesn't like, say anything to him, right? I think it was the bit where he starts talking himself up. So I'm not like a baseborn. I'm I'm like a son of Bow here, dudes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, like, I'm really important. Like you can make fun of me because I'm yeah. mortal, but do not call me baseborn. Yeah. Mm. yeah, a lot of the, the the anger that Thingol has, like I don't know if he's angry that somebody got through the girdle that he didn't want, or that like he just doesn't like men because no men have ever been in Doriath at this point, right? They say no, he doesn't he's... tolerate them in his service either. So right. he does he's... just dickish against humans but it's like he's angry at them because of what they are like i hate you because you're gonna die and i can't kill you now but yeah like you're gonna die i have to live forever yeah it's like yeah you insolence baseborn moral yeah it's it's a lot of uh, right so right right after he says that uh it says then baron looking up uh beheld the eyes of uh luthien and his glance went also to the face of melian and it seemed to him that words were put into his mouth so you're saying like that was actually melian kind of Doing yeah, the whole thing, of... that like like when Finrod found the men, he's like, "Oh, I can just read your mind." Exactly. Okay. Mm. Yeah, it's, like yeah, it's like the the uh, whole psychic connection thing, right? They they don't just talk with each other; they just like transfer their thoughts. Yeah, uh, it's, some, it's something you um I think you get from Galadriel as well in Lord of the Rings and uh. I understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and in the book, um, Galadriel actually stays with um with Thingol and Melian for a time, so she's like understudying. Mm-hmm. Right. She's an in, she's got an internship there. Mm. Uh. <laughs> yeah, that seems that's played up more in the movies where they actually like they're basically using like doing the palantir thing without the palantirs, or they can just have conversations. But here it seems like it's something they don't do all the time. But like only certain, I think only like the high elves or the the very powerful have the ability. But but Melian is more than an elf. She, she's she's a um, she's a god. Maya. Maya. So. Yeah. yeah, but I think in the books they only really do that in uh, Return of the King after the wedding when they just like look in and they see like Gandalf and Elrond and Galadriel just like sitting on a hill like <laughs> their eyes glancing at each other or something. Can I just say something? Like I I think like the first meeting. I mean the the first meetings between Baron Luthien like it, it seems like the the girl doesn't know how if she wants. <laughs> Well, if she wants to be with this guy or not, like she she comes, she goes, you know, vanishes again, and then he comes back. She comes well, isn't back. Isn't that how all your first dates go? Where you just say hi, and you pass up. out, and then they run away and they come back. That's, that's <laughs> and the, and the the that's the play hard to get. It's like this is this is the weirdest first encounter. Like this is the weirdest first date ever. Well, to be fair, it was a blind date. Neither of them knew. Yeah, nearly blind because he was asleep most of the time. He didn't probably even notice it. 
Yeah, I mean, I did want to talk about, before we get there, actually, the whole, his, like, journey from Dorthonian to uh, to Doroth, were mentioned several times that Nan, you know, Nandongortheb is the, the Valley of Dreadful Death. Like, mm. then they mention that there's these creatures there. This is, like, the most, uh, it kind of reminded me, like, Lovecraft a little bit with these, with these, you know, creatures. They're not really ever described, but they're almost too terrible to behold. Yeah, it, it's like, Tolkien goes out of his way not to tell you what they are. And we know there's mm. spiders there, but, like, do you guys think there's right. other stuff there? Is it, isn't this awful? where, um, Ongolian went to? Yeah, yeah. so, yeah. They say yeah, that it's where all her descendants are. Or which not makes, all of them, but some descendants. Which makes me think that um, when I mean at some at some point, like we 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 know that in at least in the uh, Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, like spiders are in Mirkwood. So does that mean that this place is close to where in the future the Mirkwood will be, or I don't know? No, this is all the, this is all the other side of the Blue Mountains. So yeah, like, no, none of this west makes of yeah, but, so they will have yeah. to move. Uh, they would have to move across, like. The... No, I think they mentioned that in Ungoliant, in her in her fleeing east, like she she stayed there for a while and probably gave birth to a bunch of babies, and then she continued on her way. It's like so the, the quote he uses here says, uh, "Beyond lay the wilderness of Dungortheb, where the sorcery of Sauron and the power of Melian came together, and horror and madness walked." So the whole horror and madness thing—that's a very Lovecraftian, you know, uh, trope or just phrase, pretty much right out of Lovecraft. Um, so I just picture these like Cthulhu monsters and stuff, and just like the Kraken, maybe. Yeah, but uh, maybe in the waterfall, but there's some weird land creatures as well. But it's weird that like this evil place is just on the other side of like the happy realm of, of uh, you know, of Doria. Not that it's ever really Well, that's what the there. girdle's for, friend. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Basically the deal that, like, do you think Thingol said that as a as a throwaway line? Like, oh, if, you can have my daughter when your hand holds a Silmaril? Like, that's like a, uh, you know, when the hell freezes over kind of quote, basically? Or, or he actually meant it because he says, you know... Uh, Baron basically is for little price do elven kings sell their sell their daughters for gems and things made of craft. So it seems like even he's surprised that that, that he actually even is considering. Yeah, I think so, he just kind of thought of the the most ridiculously hard thing to to do, and maybe he also kind of wants a similar role, but I think it's mainly. He was mainly looking for an impossible task to give Baron. And he also says later he, he wasn't in. It was wasn't even gonna. Yeah, that's um, what I was gonna say. Yeah, he wasn't even gonna. His word. In, the, in, the, in the same, uh, I mean, at the same time, like uh, Thingol becomes like Eurystheus uh, in uh, the Heracles uh, myth- mythology, where he basically has to do twelve impossible tasks, and they are only given to him because Eurystheus thinks that they, they are impossible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So it's like, yeah, um, probably something similar. Yeah, Tolkien never stooped to the level of having him, you know, muck out stables of dung or anything like that. No, no, right. that's that's probably not. I mean, would have been would have been fun. I mean, would have been different from. In fact, I don't think dung is ever mentioned at any point in anything <laughs> Tolkien ever wrote. <laughs> no, but because it's it's, I mean, uh, it's what not, a world. Yeah, it's not postmodern enough. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's actually. Colwick and Olwen is a Welsh tale about an impossible tasks. He has to do 40 impossible tasks to marry the king's daughter. Thank you, Wikipedia. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll link to that in the show notes, as we say, and I never do, but I'll try to remember to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, just as single, we, when, we're not sure if we can promise to keep our promise. Yeah, and this is where Melian is kind of pissed that uh, you know she knows that the doom of the, Silmar- of the, the doom of the Noldar has like affected them even there in, in Doriath, where they had nothing to do with that when it uh, when it all went down in Valinor, you know, hundreds of years ago. But she already told Thingol like way back when that the Silmarils are evil, and she perceives like bad will come to Thingol if like you know he gets involved with them, and then he goes, "Go get me a Silmaril." Yeah, yeah, probably doesn't listen that much to his <laughs> wife. <laughs> now we're heading to Nargothrond and like sort of the first leg of Baron's official quest, uh, which to me, this is one of the most confusing parts. I don't even, first time I read this, like I don't really remember much of what happened in Nargothrond with the brothers. And, but you know, when you're forced to read it line by line, like I don't, I don't understand the politics of Nargothrond. It seems very not thought well thought out <laughs> in, in my mind. But uh, if Matt, if you want to do a re- recap, then we can talk about it. I'm going to add a couple things to your oh, yeah, th- recap to... here. So Baron uh, heads to Nargothrond to seek out the help of King Felgoon. And of course he has Felgoon's ring that Barahir won due to loyalty to him. And Felgoon said, you know, whenever you guys need it, like I'm your staunchest ally, which is why he also never took another wife. And so he could be free to go off when some, you know, some higher power was calling him. And here he comes. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, Baron tells Finrod of Bear Hair's death, and because of Finrod's oath to Bear Hair, he agrees to help Baron in the quest for the Silmaril. His people are not happy about this, particularly two sons of Feanor who happen to be there, Caligorm and Curfin. Finrod surrenders his kingship to his brother Ordreth, but he's a weak ruler and there's a lot of infighting and it seems that the sons of Feanor come out on top, but they aren't made king, so they're like the power behind the throne. Finrod finds ten of his people, who I call red shirts, uh, to accompany him in <laughs> the Heron's North on the quest. a lot of red shirts in this story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They have some initial success when they kill a band of orcs, and Finrod uses his power to change their appearance into orcs. And then under that guise, they go all the way to Tol Syrian, which is now Tol and Garhoth. Yeah. Tol and Garoth, yeah. Garoth, yeah, all right. Mm. I think it's a name upgrade. And mm. that tower is now run by Sauron. Sauron uh, realizes something is up, and he's a master of sorcery and strips them of their masks. Uh, Finrod and Sa- uh, Sauron have a little batter- battle of s- in songs for mastery, and Sauron is victorious. He then imprisons them all in his dungeons, and one by one, of course, the ten that are nameless um, are tortured and slain by werewolves. But uh, none will admit their true purpose. Yeah, I forgot Back to put that. Doria- that's, that's why he's torturing them, is because he wants to know what the hell they're doing there. Right. Back in Doriath, uh, Luthien knows that Baron is in trouble. I'm, I don't quite remember how she knew, but uh, maybe it's a woman's intuition. I think intuition. Melian gives, she has said something to her. I think she gets a feeling when Baron gets thrown into the dungeon, she gets, like, she feels that passes. something is wrong. Yeah. yeah, it says, In the time when Sauron cast Baron into the pit, a weight of horror came upon her heart. And then she went to her mother for counsel, and she learned that Baron lay in uh, Sauron's tower, basically. So I guess Melian, mm. like, helped her figure out her feelings. Right. <laughs> because um, Melian is a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> um, You're mine, so she'd probably be able to help you a lot. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh so Luthien tries to leave, but then will imprison her in a tree t- in a treehouse. Um raised way up high and uh takes down the ladder so she grows her hair super long rapunzel style she escapes doriath but comes across this, uh the sons of fianor caligorm and Quirfin, who were you know had left uh felgoon's caves and um their awesome hound named huan while they're out on a hunt she expects them to aid her but they decide to kidnap her instead and caligorm decides he wants to marry her they take her back to nargothron and imprison her huan the hound feels sorry for luthien and helps her escape they escape Nargothron and head north to where Baron is in prison. So, yeah, Huan's pretty cool. He was the hunting hunting dog of Oromir. He was born in Valinor, which is why he has, like, some cool powers and is huge. And he kind of just sees that, like, the sons of Feanor are dicks and Luthien didn't deserve that. Any el- anything else? Well, I just would talk a little bit about Huan because he uh, he's, you know, pretty much the hero of the story. Um, it seems like everybody knows his, like, doom or, like, the mythology that's, that he's, he's allowed to speak three times before he dies. And he's he can, o- I believe he can only be slayed by the greatest wolf in the land. Like, that's kind of like his, like, everybody knows that about him, right? Right. Um, yeah. It's like, it's like you don't even, he doesn't even have to present himself. People say, like, I know you, guy. I know you. <laughs> like, well, I... I always pictured him as like uh, Clifford the Big Red Dog until Mulan came out, and now I think of him as like a dragon dog. Yeah, I, like that. I always thought he, I always thought he looked a bit like um, Droopy. <laughs> Sad a bit like him as well. I just thought, you know, maybe maybe a bigger version of the Hound of Baskerville or something like that. I don't know, something big and ferocious. Yeah, he's not a Maya basically. He's just like a, a dog that you know, the Vala decided to give magic powers to. Well, that was my so. question because. If he came over from Valinor, he's been alive for at least 500 years, so he's got to, he can't just be a dog, right? He's right. Well, he's, and, I, and I think it's uh, like the same kind of thing as we'll talk about the werewolves, but it's it's like you know good, entrapped good spirits inside. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, okay. it's, it maybe maybe like the eagles. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah, a magic dog. That. I would imagine. Fine, he's a magic dog. Okay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> But did anyone else, like, because the first time I read this, I remember, like, when he showed up and he started talking, like, it almost took me out of it. I was like, I can, everything else is fine. But, like, when there was this magic dog, I was like, all right, JR, you're laying it on a little thick here. But, uh, I mean, now it's fine. But, like, it kind of did take me out of it the first time. I loved it. It's, it's like, so, so random. And it's, you know, it's just like you accept it because, you know, there's a lot of else, there's a lot of other weird shit, weird shit happening in this world. So, you know, why not? Why not have a big talking dog that, that, can you know that only can die 
by fighting the, the biggest, weirdest werewolf that there is. So it's like, yeah, why not? Yeah. I, right? also I mean, there's awesome. talking elves, so... Yeah, and he's, like, as a character, he's probably better and more loyal and more of a good character than any of the elves that are in the Silmarillion. Like, he's... I, I like him better than all of the sons of, of Feanor because he's oh. he's just because he's noble. He's so, noble, and he. he my is shedding a tear. <laughs> and he dies for this his for this noble cause, and he he's just so awesome. He's he's like he's yeah. a good dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You no, know he's a good dog because <laughs> after they do this, like after they do this, and uh, Huan helps uh, Luthien escape, he, he basically goes back to Kilagorn. They're a bit less buddies, but at but still at this point, still friends. It seems yeah. it's only later that he completely leaves him. Right, so the torture maybe we can talk about um, because it seems like you know on a technicality they got captured, like Finrod and his friends. So right, it's like they 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 should have reported. To the tower, and that would have been it. It's like yeah, like it was that's another sort of stuff it, you would expect in in Martin's world as well, right? It's like you know we have rules here. You don't follow the rules, but you know. Well, yeah, we I like win. it how it, it shows how bureaucratic the orcs actually or the, the bad guys are because you see that again and and when Sam and Frodo are dressed up as as the orcs in in Return of the King and like they're like I'll take your number and I'm gonna report you and like yeah these are these yeah. awful beings who rape pillage and but they also have like paperwork. <laughs> You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially like Sauron, he he himself keeps apparently watch in the tower. It's like you know, just because he's he's probably bored up there. He's got nothing to do. Probably has really bad internet too. <laughs> <laughs> no one on the Wi-Fi in Torin Goroth is awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I like the name though. Like that's that's, I can never oh, say yeah, that's a I badass always, name. I always want to say yeah. Guar, like I, the UA, and then saying an AU. It, it doesn't. It's not how I think of it in my brain. But yeah. Uh, you see, I'd Island imagine it more like a Guar show. So I like Guar. <laughs> okay, I don't know what that is. Gara. Oh man, they're a hard rock band that dresses up in costume and sprays a like crowd with blood and other bodily fluids. Oh. They're pretty intense. I'm on board with the blood, but not the other bodily fluids. <laughs> like, I like the way that Luthien escapes, though. Um, but at the same time, it's it's still like the um. And I I only bring this up because I recently watched Into the Woods because there's a there's a scene that that uh, in the stage production where the two princes are in the woods basically singing the reprise of Agony. And then so, somewhere in the background, they hear like Rapunzel screaming because he has a manic depression or something. Mm-hmm. And one of the princes goes, Rapunzel. And it's like this this sort of thing. Uh, I mean, Kilogram Kurufin, like coming across a, a woman in the woods, you know, that that basically is like Rapunzel in this in this moment. It's really weird. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like she literally back. grows her hair out and she escapes. You know, yeah. It's, it's, like, I, I feel Token, like, being all clever. Like, I'm going to do a clever allegory to Rapunzel here. But, like, it's, yes. it is Rapunzel. There's no subtlety there's, whatsoever. There's one thing that I find really weird is that her hair can can make people fall asleep. I think that's just something that, like, yeah. her body emanates. Like, that's, like, her power. And she can, like, use it where she And is that sleep. why and Baron fell asleep? She's an X-Men, right? <laughs> <laughs> is that her, her hair's made of roof and all. <laughs> Every time she gets on the Blackbird, it just crashes. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, you can't let her on the X-Men team. She keeps crashing. The pilots keep passing out. But no, yeah, that's probably why he kept, in their weird meeting, he just kept uh, swooning and swooning and swooning. But Maybe that's, that's why Thingo keeps her inside. Like, don't don't put my kingdom to sleep. Right. But that's a pretty badass scene. You know, oh, just like to, uh, to picture, like, the, the triple-trunked tree with no lower branches and this, you know, giant tree house basically at the top of it. And this yeah. is, again, where Darren uh, betrays to her, betrays to the king that she left. So this is, like, strike two on Darren. Doesn't and also, it? like, obviously they didn't see the movies because an elf can basically use a tree as, like, you know, a fire pole, according to, like, the newest Hobbit movie where they're jumping <laughs> nimbly dimbly branch to branch. <laughs> <laughs> nimbly uh, dimbly that's those are, those elves are elves of doria nimbly and dimbly but they're just not never right. on the page they but hang. let's just talk about Kelegor and Kurofin for a second because these i mean these guys are obviously the biggest assholes of the family right uh, yeah they jerks they they are the jerks um maybe say for the true jerks but um it's it's um to me it feels like we, we because we t- we try to discuss the political uh system at uh, Nagathrond um i just feel 
I, yeah, this is sort of the idea of, you know, you have a, a puppet ruler, basic, not a puppet ruler, but it's like they have basically usurped the power in a sense because they have popular support. Right, I didn't know if they ever actually did though, because like they're they're basically they they came there after the battle, you know, to, and they because they they basically lost their lands, correct? Mm. You know, so but yeah. it seems like yeah, I don't know why Finn like... wouldn't be loved by his people. He built them this place. He's their king, and then yeah, when he gives it, it to his brother. His brother is kind of like I guess a feeble, not feeble, but just not doesn't have the, the I think the they like power behind warm tongued him. him. Yeah, <laughs> like, I can see. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. um yeah, and there's another thing um they've Baron turns up says yeah I've, I've got this quest I'm gonna get a Selmerall. And they should be helping him, but instead they say, "Oh no, we're gonna hate, for, we're gonna hate you forever." Um, we uh, hate you forever. We hate you forever. Yeah. Um, huh? And the only person they should uh, pursue with hate or whatever is Morgoth, who has the Silmarils. But no, they, instead, they go for the easy targets. No, they hate everyone who but touches. That's, the that's part yeah. of the doom. Like is they, basically they, they're so part, single-minded yeah. about it that they're gonna. They don't see the big picture. But, they can only see short term. Yeah. Uh, and later on, they said, "Oh." Yeah, let Fingon go. We'll take over Doreth, and then we'll take over the whole of everyone, and then we'll go for him. Mm-hmm. So they're not really. They only. They need like enact the oath when it suits them, really. Which is weird because Korofin. I mean, because we know that Kelegom, like he, he's really blunt when what he says, and Korofin is actually much. He seems much more reasonable when he speaks. But they both end up saying the same thing. So it's like, yeah, one is more sophisticated, maybe in what in how he expresses himself, but at the same time, they just say this, they're just saying the same thing. They're both really selfish. Um, I'd I'd say it's it's you know it's just to show also that the curse is self fulfilling actually, because they are they they're just foolish. Um, right. And yeah, they. I mean, I I don't know. They like. I mean, they they don't make themselves really popular. If if you know, if it comes out that they actually kidnap Luthien, it it you know they they're not right. gonna be. Uh, Fingal's gonna be pissed. Yeah, it's like they they make a dumb move after the other. So it's. Yeah, well, they, they do get kicked out later on. Right, it does come back yeah, to haunt do. them. But they kind of do what, you know, when, I don't know if it's them exactly, but when Aeol basically kidnaps Aradel and makes her marry him, and then he visits the other sons of Feanor, and like, we don't take lightly to, to elves that kidnap our, our brethren and may force them to marry against their will, and that's pretty much what they're doing right here. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, wasn't Caligorm uh, Celebrimbor's father? Yeah. Yeah, because uh, so, we later so on... So isn't we... that passion of, like, trying to, like, learn something new like why like okay so they know sauron he's bad and then calabrimbor is like oh yeah well, i'll teach you how to make rings yeah but i'll make like, these three rings for myself yeah they, they, I mean, yeah i mean i I don't think that the uh, elven ring i mean sauron didn't even touch the elven i mean i don't think that he has even seen them so he hasn't any control over them which is probably right. why they're not that worried uh but um, I, I don't think Caliburn Boy is like. I mean, he's he doesn't seem to be an asshole. Well, no, like, he kind of once his, once the truth comes out about his his father, he basically renounces him, you know, and he, he remains yeah. in Arthron when they're kind of exiled. Which is sad, actually. Like you, you you'd say, oh, they could yeah, but, probably could they could probably sort this out, you know, this family business. But still, my I, I think my point more was like he still goes in the like workshop with Sauron and they both like learn off each other and then both go out in secret and make their own set of rings. Like, I don't know. It just seems like seems yeah, too far, uh, far an apple from the tree, you know? It's been so long, you know, first age, I mean, first age, second age, like sometimes you forget, right? People change. <laughs> and plus that was when Sauron was in his like fair to look upon mode, you know, and, and sweet talking mode, right? Where he was. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, his name was still Sauron. He was the prom queen. It's like it's like if if Charlie Sheen were to come like and uh, like knocking on my door selling me Girl Scout cookies, I would still turn him away. Like even if he was all dressed up and talking nice, I'd be like, "You are crazy, get away." Yeah. Well, not if they were those really good coconut ones, right? The uh, yeah. Samoa. Even if he was oh. wearing a dress, even if he looked like your dead wife. <laughs> uh. Well, luckily I don't have that issue. <laughs> Wives are dead. What dead wife? Back in the dungeons of uh, Sauron, only Baron and Finrod are alive. You know, hooray. Uh, when a werewolf tries to kill Baron, Finrod hulks out, breaks his chains, and wrestles the beast to death, but is fatally wounded while doing so, and Baron cries a lot. Um, Finrod dies j- just as Lucian arrives. She sings a song like Sam, and Baron hears, like Sam was Gamji, and Baron hears her and answers like Frodo Baggins, mm. and he then passes out. Sauron tends his uh, Sauron sends his beasts against uh, against her, but Huan 
kills them one by one. It's like he's also not very smart because yeah, he sent one at just one at a time. Yeah. Um, standard so super hit, standard super villain there. Yeah, <laughs> the last move to attack Huan was a massive werewolf uh, called Draugluin. Yeah, the father of the werewolves, basically. He's mortally wounded, but before he dies, he crawls back to Sauron and tells him that it is Luthien and Huan at the gates. And Sauron, uh, you know, being arrogant as he is, thinks that he can fulfill. Huan's uh, destiny and takes the shape of a werewolf and attacks Huan. So uh, Luthien helps out uh, by, uh, I think she she casts her uh, mantle over his eyes for a second and so right, he'd be yeah. sleepy for a, se- uh, for a second. It's like, you, you, swoon, <laughs> you don't swoon, imagine Sauron. Sauron swoon. Yeah, and so Sauron surrenders to, uh, I mean, so yeah, they, they defeat Sauron and he surrenders to Huan. But the second he is free, he shapeshifts into a giant bat slash vampire and uh, flies away to Morgoth in Angband. Luthien breaks the gates of Sauron's fortress and all the prisoners are freed. She finds Beren mourning over Finrod's body. They bury Finrod beneath the tower and he, uh, he used to, that he used to rule over and they and then they leave. So um, Huan returns to Nagothrond with many of the prisoners who were of Fingrod's people. They tell of what the son, of what the sons of Fear and what Noah did to Luthien and of their cowardice. And so Orodrith finds his uh, finds his balls and they banish Kilgorm and Kor from Nagathron. <laughs> Good riddance. Yeah, I was surprised when Tolkien said that. He said they found his balls. That was very uh, ah, not yeah. Tolkienish. Mm. No, that that is cool. very noble. Did a crotch uh-huh. grab and was like, get out. Get <laughs> yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> so Beren and Luthien head back to Doriath. And Beren wants Luthien safe before he departs again for Angband. On their way, they are, they are set upon by Kelegorm and Korofin. Beren gets the better of them. And Huan joins Beren in, atta- in attacking his master. And Luthien doesn't let them kill the Sons of Fear, nor but Beren strips Korofin of his gear and takes his knife. And I also think his horse. Yeah. Um, as they depart, Korofin shoots two arrows at Luthien. One which Huan snaps in, in midair. So he's really <laughs> awesome. And the other one, uh, basically, uh, Baron takes for for Luthien, and he he's he's wounded. Uh, and while Huan is chasing them away, Luthien tries to to heal Baron. And so uh, Baron Luth- Luthien and Huan return to Doriath, where Luthien mends his wounds and heals him. Yeah, let's let's look at you know what we have. Like we get stuff about werewolves here, sure, which sure is. is always fun. They're not werewolves like we have in. You know, in our mythology, they're not men turning into into wolves. They're not wags either. Um, but it's weird that Tolkien would use the term because where is I believe it's the old English word for man, and a lot of this is based right. on like ancient, you know, Middle and Old English. So, and he's such a word yeah. freak that that's why I think there is some like he wouldn't use that word if he, that's not what he but, meant. He explains it how it, how it how it works. Like these are wolves that are basically inhabited by evil spirits. Mm-hmm. Right. That's so I they're mean, not wogs because wogs are not. Like inhabited by evil spirits, they're just no, they're just wolves that that you know happen to be able to communicate with each other. Yeah. But it also seems they're able to communicate like with other species, like because the wargs you could probably not understand, but um, yeah, they they can they can talk to Sauron. Yeah, werewolves are like the evil eagles who on kind of thing where they're like I think yeah. they're more sentient. Like as far as why they're named werewolves, no idea. No, right. no, they're just big wolves. They're just. Big wolves that you know that are basically they they the anti Huan basically um, because he's been given powers Precisely. by the Valar and the, the werewolves are inhabited by evil spirits put in, and put into them by by Melkor anyway it's it's basically they they are meant to fight each other so that's that's where Huan's destiny comes from I guess the fact that uh, Sauron can shape shift and 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 stuff I think this is meant to be an a, a sort of it's meant to allude probably to the fight that um, the that uh, Heracles has with one with a river god basically on one of his quests where he basically transforms into different animals Heracles manages to wrestle with him and and defeat him and you know ask him information about I mean I think it's probably something about the um, gardens of the uh, with the golden apples basically he has to find so he has to ask him the way and then uh, i think that that's where i that's what at least that's what i think of when i you know 
think of the fact that Sauron basically has to wrestle with Huan and shapeshifts and, and everything. Yeah, so I did like, like that where he was almost like where he had him in his jaws and he was like almost blinking yeah. in from like one thing to another. Like he was, I really like yeah, that. Yeah. And that's where he, he's like, all right, all I'll, right, I'll tap out. And of course, he just uses mm. it to, to escape. But I just I want to talk a little bit about the actual using like the singing as sorcery. Um, I know Matt, yeah. you put a you put the note in there about. Um, about the White Council. Oh, the White Council? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like... In the Hobbit movie, the fact that they're fighting them, like, at arms and said, like, like, I mean, it would have come off really awful on film and they could have just skipped over it and been like, oh, yeah, like, we beat them, yeah. like they do in the book. You know, but, like, um, this goes back to the beginning with the, you know, the song, the music is the big theme with the creation and the music of the INR, and it seems like the power is right. bound up in music. And when I heard of the White Council, just from reading The Hobbit and when it's mentioned in Lord of the Rings, I always pictured it as, like, a circle of, like, Elrond, Galadriel, like, all the powerful people just, like, using their minds to, like, force him out. Like, I never pictured actual, you know, giant, right. you know, like, a, a huge action sequence. And it was fun to right. watch, but I was like, I, I unnecessary. Yeah. I mean, yes. I, I think I think like they had to find like a better mix between like a huge action sequence and like coral line or something. Like <laughs> they, you know, like they couldn't have made it as cheesy as that. But like at the same time, it's like no, they just like you know, Professor X. Like you know, they could have all just put their like hand on their temple yeah. and like <laughs> drove out these spirits or something like that. You know, but that would have been. Yeah. Still- I, I think I actually called that scene an abortion because that's how bad it was. Yeah, the, the thing that I, I find interesting is that, you know, Sauron, basically, he's he's tactically stupid because he just sends out one after the other. It's, you know, it's like, that's not what you want to do. You send out everyone at once so that, you know, at, at some point he just can't deal with everyone. I don't think he, I think the way he fra- it was phrased, he, he, he didn't actually know what was out there. So he sent a scout. And that scout died, so he sent another one, and that one died, yeah. and he sent another. Which, to be fair, by that point, he should probably send more. He should have come out but himself, isn't, right? Isn't point. it a tower? Said, like, can he send be... someone to the top of the tower to look down? I just figured, Wouldn't like, that be more useful. There, yeah. it's Luthien. That's and, where and he North. was, wasn't it? They've got some magical, you know, shroud around them, and but he doesn't know it's them until he sends Drogluin, you know, and then he comes back and dies at his feet. Um, but Drug Lewin also is one of those na- like every name of the bad guys in here. Even if you knew nothing about the story, I love how he picks these names that when you say them, right. you just feel dirty <laughs> or just like, oh, this is awful. Like, <laughs> like Thorin, Thorin. Gethel, yeah. and Drug Lewin and Karkroth. Like these are not people or pets you want to have. <laughs> That's just no, good but... PR. Like you don't want to mess with anything called like Drug Lewin. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're like Karkroth. No, you know. <laughs> He's not even the biggest one. Like Sauron, it's it said like when Sauron transforms into a werewolf, he's like the mightiest uh, werewolf who walked the earth until this until this point. So I I don't I don't necessarily know like if if uh, you know Kakaroth was still growing in in Angband at this point. It, it just seems yeah, it like, like Kakaroth is a separate. He's not. I guess he's more than just a werewolf. Even though they do call him a werewolf, like he's this other beast. And since like Morgoth, no, he's a awesome. werewolf. He's just really, really big. Right. He's but he's, just... He was like Plus he had a Silmaril. Pet. He had a Silmaril in his stomach. Yeah. That so makes that it... that made him even more powerful. I yeah. think. Yeah, but it gave him indigestion real bad. But we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they didn't have uh, anti Silmarillion Pepto Bismol or anything to to give him. Yeah. Uh, but My Lanta like... for Silmarils. <laughs> My doctor yeah. said no Silmarils. I think there's a bit of irony <laughs> in this that you know Finrod basically is is buried beneath the tower that he. Yeah, I want uh, to read that. Just the way this little chapter ends. Um, it kind oh of yeah, gives that's us a great. Little answer. I, it's it's one of the more bittersweet, and it's like Tolkien gives you this little one sentence that explains so much. You know, because we're debating about what happens to men, but you know, when elves go to Mandos, do they go there and then do they get to go hang out in Valimar, or only some of them, or when they when they return, there's always the question of returning. And uh, so it says they buried the body of Felagund on the hilltop of his own isle and it was clean again and the green grave of Finrod Finarfin's son fairest of all the princes of the elves remained inviolate until the land was changed and broken and founded under destroying seas which basically happens in like 50 years but still Um, but then they say but Finrod walks with Finarfin his father beneath the trees in Eldemar and like that just came out of nowhere really and it kind of First of all, it made me think, wait a minute, Finarfin's dead? But then I realized, no, this is like after he got out, after Finrod must have got out of Mandos, right? And then he gets to hang out in, in Valimar again. Is, is that correct? Because we never hear about Finarfin dying. He stayed behind. He never, never. Right. Went right. Yeah, he's, I mean, maybe Mandos has like weekend furlongs, stuff like that. Like, visiting hours. 
Yeah, exactly. Conjugal visits. Do you picture Mandos as a prison? I always thought it was more of a place of rest, where like once you're like once you're ready to be reborn, you can. It's like a waiting hall in a bank. Basically, they make you wait there forever. It's it's like the the grocery store line that I sat in earlier that <laughs> went all the way to the deli counter, like through the freezer aisle, around the meats to the deli counter. You're just okay. waiting for your chance. <laughs> that's that's purgatory. The thing that I'm, you know surprised by is that you know it's not Kelegon who shoots at, uh, at uh, Luthien it's Korofin because Korofin seems a bit more reasonable I mean in, in how he speaks but as, I, as we said earlier like they essentially are saying the same thing even if one is more refined than the other yeah, but in, in the end, it turns out they're you know they're they're not different from each other. Basically, it's yeah. it's. But just the whole killing, like any time an elf kills an elf, like that's because we've read this. We know the the kinsling and Alcalande was like the most unforgivable thing, and then they're like, okay, we can't have her. I'm gonna shoot her with an arrow. Like it seems like there should be something between I'm pissed and I'm gonna kill you. But it I it just bothers me. And that was one of the things in the Hobbit movie too, seeing like all the dead elves. Like it really affected me. Like the elves are not supposed uh-huh. to die like this, and then just seeing all the bodies and it just seems like it's such a cavalier decision. That, that they make to just shoot Luthien, who's like the best or uh, most one of the most important elves ever, apparently. Because they wanted to hurt Baron, probably. It's like, yeah, you want to take our Somaro? Here you go. Um, but at this well, point, think... it's like um, Huan cancels his. Uh, I mean, he, he basically um, quits, and so he chases them, and they are, you know, they're rightfully afraid, and so they they make sure they get out of there. Because yeah, um, up till this point he was helping Baron and Luthien, but he always returned to them. But this is where he basically yeah. forsakes them and the, and joins Luthien and Baron for the rest of their their journey. But it yeah. keeps with the, their character because like Luthien's like by all accounts, well, it's stated like most beautiful of any elf that was ever made. So like she's a Silmaril. Like mm-hmm. this dude can't have her. So we'll just like kill it rather than see someone else with it. Yeah, I don't think they care about her that much. They just want. I mean, it's just because they know that Baron is. Uh, obviously, they 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 suspect that he's going for his, for a summerel anyway. So it's well, they know that, right? Yeah, they know yes. that. I yeah, but I was always under the impression that they never really could be absolutely sure about it. I'm not sure because um, I always I always felt like they were speaking out. You know, they were they were saying like, you know, don't you go off if you go after summerel and you keep it and you don't hand it over to us, then you, you're gonna have some problems with us. But if you don't, then that's fine with us. You know, I, I just felt that they couldn't. They, I, I don't know when they when they learned about that. Like when when did they absolutely have a confirmation that he wanted a summer? Like, he, he goes up to Fenrod and and he says tell and he tells him what he's up to. Oh, it's so, so, in the same room. Yeah, yeah. So just, I, mean, I, I, I haven't. I, I read the, I read the chapter this morning, but you know, not not in all the, all in detail because it's a long chapter. And so. also, when Luthien meets them, she she tells them right, and basically because she assumes they're going to help her, mm. and then of course. Yeah. It doesn't happen. Do you think she might be a bit naive in some ways? Well, she's been sheltered her whole life. It's like yeah. <laughs> she couldn't possibly be more sheltered of any any uh, elf princess. Uh, I think that that we meet, right? Yeah. I mean, maybe the ones that like stayed in Valinor, but <laughs> that's a completely different class. Okay. So Baron heals and decides to head back to Amband without Lufing, also singing a song on the way. Having hear, hearing the song, Luthien's having none of this, and she follows him north of Am- to Ambang with Huan. Uh, in order to get past Morgoth's forces, Morgoth's forces, they take the shape of Drogluin and Thrun uh, a wolf and a vampire bat. Beren and Luthien then go together to Ambang in the form of wolf and bat. There's a huge werewolf at the gates of Ambang named Karkaroth. Luthien sings to the beast uh, and sends it to sleep, and together they enter and band and head to the deepest layer where Morgoth resides. Uh, she claims to be a minstrel and Morgoth lusts for her and allows her to sing and he falls asleep um, and Baron uses and falls off like, um, um, no, he falls off his throne like a, an avalanche, which I thought was pretty cool. And uh, so Baron uses Kurofin's knife to cut a single off from his crown, but gets a bit greedy and tries to go for another one. But the blade um, snaps and then he wakes Morgoth up. So together they flee and, and are stopped by Karkaroth. The beast attacks Beren and bites off his hand that holds a Silmaril. The jewel burns Karkaroth from the inside and he flees. Uh, right when the forces of Morgoth start to awake and Beren is severely wounded and then, uh, surprise, surprise, the eagles come. And uh, <laughs> Thorondor, ca- <laughs> Thorondor and his crew of uh, um, Helos um, carry them up and away back to Doriath. Yeah. So- yeah. Eagles, Eagles yeah. again. 
<laughs> but you don't we'll, say. We'll Eagles. get to the Eagles at the end. I mean, this is basically, you know, Morgoth as Hades with Cerberus guarding the gates. It's basically, whatever it, happens to Morgoth, like, it affects everyone who's connected to him. So when the when the blade strike, the, the chip hits his face, they say that all of his forces quailed. He signed. groaned and stirred, and the host of Angban moved in sleep. So it was, yeah, they knew it was time to get out of there. The, but, the, the thing I'm, I'm going to have to disagree, I mean, it's it's like, you know, when you say he's Hades, I think, like, uh, just, just, you know, Hades as a as a uh, Greek god has a bit of a bad rap because it's like you know. Oh, I know. He right. lost. The, he lost. Yeah, Hades the, the, the is the like Mandos, throw. where it's just like it's like Hades, my realm. It's Zeus and and Poseidon is basically the nice one in in Greek mythology. It's like you know, Christian imagery has sort of ruined the the uh, right. the, the presentation of of Hades. So it's like. Yeah, everything that's connected to hell is is connected to Hades. So it's like that. That's not. No, I understand exactly. that, but like you kind of, but, it kind of feels with like you know Persephone and, and maybe Luthien coming exactly, down and she's yeah. singing to him. And with, no, that's just, true. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be scene for scene, but you can't help but I mean a, a guy underground. No. But yes, yeah, so I I mean technically, I guess Mandos would be closer to Hades because he's in charge of the dead. I love uh, Tedard's pronunciation of Kothira. Uh, I can't even say it. Kothira. Um, you but, gotta do the on the Kakara. Uh, the Red Ma like, on Foglier. It's like Son Goku. The, the Jaws name, of, right? Like those are badass names. Come on now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I like the fact as well, um, that after hearing about Juan Morgoth just takes the, he he doesn't take like the biggest wolf, he takes the runt and then yeah. feed and feeds it up to make <laughs> it like the biggest, baddest wolf ever. Because probably the runts had issues and he gets bullied, so uh, <laughs> Oh, uh, so it's like you know he's being so it's nice. Ghost to... syndrome. So it goes from uh, goes from a uh, song of ice and fire. Sorry, I don't know. It's a, it's like you know it's it's. Uh... Oh, I just completely lied. Like what ghost? There's no ghosts in a song of ice. And fire. Like, oh, ghosts. Okay, I get it. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was the run of the litter. Now he's the biggest. Come on, guys. Yeah, uh, but it's it's um so so Margaret is Jon Snow. All right, Basically. let's not go down that road, guys. He knows no. nothing. <laughs> he knows nothing. Like, well, they might be both in the void right now. We don't know. Mm, yeah. but I don't want to have to put any spoilers in this that I don't have to put in. So. <laughs> yeah, okay. After let's show. talk about the werewolf. Let's talk about the huge, yeah. uh, about the huge wolf and in Jamie's hand. Um, <laughs> it's <laughs> God damn it. Before that... they actually get in there, like I really like the scene where they're um, where Baron is kind of like get, psyching himself up to go in. And he sings that um, the song to Luthien, which I always like to think that this was Tolkien basically writing about his wife Edith, because we know that he was you know madly in love with her. They had this kind of fairy tale meeting, and you know as we discussed or uh, we mentioned that on their tombstones is Baron and Luthien. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I kind of you don't mind if I just read it. It's it's a it's a short little poem, but it's basically him saying like I'm glad to have met you, basically, even though I'm probably going to my death. This is right before he's ready to to go, yeah. in, before he knows that she's gonna you know come and help him. He says. Well, uh, I mean. This is a Valentine episode, right? It is a Valentine. This is the VOK yes, Valentine so, episode. That's right. So let's do the poems. Farewell, sweet earth and northern sky, forever blessed since here did lie, and here with lissom limbs did run beneath the moon, beneath the sun. Luthien to Nuvio, more fair than mortal tongue can tell. Though all to ruin fell the world, and were dissolved and backward hurled, unmade into the old abyss, yet were its making good for this, the dusk, the dawn, the earth, the sea, that Luthien for a time should be. Chills. Very powerful, very, very sweet. But then uh, she comes and helps him out, so it's not that bad after yeah, So basically the giant bats as well that we haven't heard of before. Like, Thuringwithil is a... She's uh, she's his like messenger raven because they say she's the uh, like the the messenger uh, the guy that she's goes the between Sauron and Morgoth and she's the Marceline of this world, mm-hmm. I guess. If you watch Adventure Time, you know this in joke. I... I did not get that reference. No, yeah, Peter will get it. I know you guys love Adventure Time. I haven't gotten into it yet. Big vampire, but never never seen again. Like never mentioned again. We know the like at the Battle of Five Armies to have like bats bred for one purpose war it's yeah i don't know no they're also uh, taxi cabs so. yeah <laughs> what, what, what? <laughs> only when an elf is riding it right God damn it i hate that I would, keep it separate keep it separate i would imagine like you know because it says in the book that she basically at the beginning she has to sort of claw herself you know into the wolf's skin basically it's like that i would look weird like a big bat hanging off her 
wolf like running across the land. So it's like uh. well, there's a really I don't know if you have the illustrated edition, but the painting of uh, of of Baron and Luthien when they're in their form is actually really cool. Um, it's by Ted Naismith, where it's basically it just shows yeah, them running really across creepy. the plane, and it's some of the times when he draws Juan Juan Juan, he uh, it comes across as like Juan. yeah Juan when he draws Juan the wolf. It's uh, it's not, it's like silly, and it doesn't. It's not like epic enough, and the, but this the scene is, is particularly haunting, and you always see that their eyes are like you can always tell their eyes are good because it's their eyes are bright, not like evil. Right. Am I uh, anyone who's sorry for the wolves and the bats here in this chapter? Uh, because it's like, oh, they just you know they they they're just doing their thing and they're getting massacred. Wolves and bats don't have cute faces, so people don't care about them. I know. They're not you feel bad for the or, orcs? Come on, man. Yeah. No, no one does yeah. that. They're totally evil. It's like, yeah, we can be totally I feel, I feel bad for the bats in America with their little, like, white fugness noses that they're all dying. <laughs> but not bats in this story. And then also, uh, I'm always kind of annoyed when the eagles show up. But you, all, when you think about it, they don't ever show up when you really need them. They show up after something really bad happens, right before something worse is going to happen. You know, so like like they let Thorin die, but then they rescue. You know, they'll take, you know, they'll come after that. But you know, they'll they'll let Baron get his hand cut off and the Silmaril swallowed. But then they'll come and get you. You know, like it's never like if they show up at the beginning, like it's battle over. When the Eagles are here, that's why it always kind of annoys me. But it's it's never that bad when the Eagles, even though it is like a yeah. Deus Ex Machina thing of, of him just I'm going to save you now. Except <laughs> in uh, Return of the King is like when they actually like are attacking the Ring Wraiths. Mm-hmm. Usually, like they're just there to save someone or get mm-hmm. them out of a perilous situation. Mm-hmm. Well, that battle was more of like they were all in on basically, you know, buying time and drawing off as many forces as possible. So that that made sense, even though, uh, yeah. But they made quick work out of those uh, the ring. Dude, rings. we've we've had battles where the eagles haven't shown up at all. Like, no. Oh, you know, they have a to number pick cheers. <laughs> yeah, battle of Helm's Deep haven't shown up there. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in the books, Helm's Deep was nothing. It was only the movie that made it into this like epic last stand. Yeah, they were like, it's... "We're gonna go hang out with the, in the mountains. We're fine." And then the orcs come. And, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Pelennor Fields. They didn't show up at the Pelennor Fields either. Yeah, they didn't right. need them at the Pelennor Fields. Uh, I think they could use them. Yeah, but then it would, wouldn't. It would be like the skirmish of Pelennor Fields if, if the Eagles showed up. <laughs> yeah. Eagles are. We'll agree to disagree. Okay. <laughs> We'll have a separate one on the role of the eagles in the in Tolkien's works. That actually might be an interesting conversation. Oh, it'll just be a bitch about fest about the eagles. Yeah. <laughs> it's like stupid birds <laughs> always coming and saving us. All right, so we're kind of approaching the end of their their tale. But did anyone have anything else to say about the escape of Baron Luthien and that whole the actual cutting of the Silmaril? The going one step too far. Did you do you think you could stop after just one like Pringles Silmarils? You can't have just one. Probably not. Oh. I, I think it's actually fate that he didn't actually get. It wasn't meant to be. It's like the, the knife. To me, it's always like the knife snapped for a reason. I think he, he, was, he pretty much more... says that, but the doom was not to, something along those lines where it snaps and wakes Morgoth up. Well, uh, Baron's doom allowed him into the girdle of Melian anyway. Like his, like the fact that he got greedy. I feel like is like Last Crusade when Indiana Jones like just sees like the girl try for the Grail and like you know. Die. Elsa, take my hand. Elsa. He chose. Um, but, poorly. but it just... poorly. <laughs> yeah. Also, sure uh, Morgoth babies. Morgoth babies. Excuse well, me. Well, he he sort of had the idea when Luthien turned up. He said, mm, "Morgoth babies." <laughs> What? I don't like, know if he was thinking of babies. He was he was more lusty than uh, and plus. Oh. oh yeah. Hey, the dirty old man. A, a, by this time, he's given enough power away from himself as a valor that he might be a Maiar, and you know, he's he, he, he might be able it's, it's to been done procreate. Before. He's ugly. He can't get a date by himself, right? There. Yeah, but he's, I mean, he's he ugly. But he's got like the best clothes. Home. So it's yeah, it's but Luffy is beautiful and is roofing everyone. But uh, I don't like how he thought he was being smart by uh, like I'm gonna let her sing for me, but I know what's going on, and of course, I then I fall off my throne and pass out. I, I just thought that the the crown. I always felt. I always understood that just the crown fell off. It's like, it they like were... he tumbled from the he tumbled from the chair because otherwise because he I pictured him like laying on the ground and and the crown right there because that's when Baron like tries to take it out and it flicks him in the face. Because for example, that would have felt to me like he would have woken up at that point, like he's falling flat on his face. It's like you wouldn't even notice that a bit. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe no, he's got I really was... thick carpeting. Like I always thought, uh, they were like you know, BuzzFeed, like, drunkest moments, and it's just, like, still sitting in his chair, but, like, his head is on the floor. 
Mm. Like just past that. Yeah. 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 It's it's good to get these specifics worked out 100%. <laughs> Me too, yeah. Yeah, that's really important. All right, so this is basically the, the last part of the story, which it's the end of this chapter, but it's not the end of Baron and Luthien. So Luthien uh, heals Baron of his wounds, and he calls himself Arcamian. Sort of, he gets a little uh, cognomen sub subname there, uh, which means one-handed. Uh, they have peace for a while in Doria. They hang out without actually going back to Thingol and Melian. Um, but eventually Baron convinces Luthien to return to her to her home. They find that not all all is not well in Doria. Uh, Darren the Minstrel has sort of renounced the kingdom and fled east. Um, Millian no longer counsels Thingol, and the best and the beast Karkaroth, uh, with the Silmaril in its belly, has been rampaging throughout the land, destroying everything in its path. Baron tells Thingol that he has fulfilled his quest, since even now his hand holds the Silmaril. And this is like the one time in the whole book that Thingol like, kind of softens a bit, and he actually realizes what he made this guy do, and he takes pity on them, and he does allow Baron and Luthien to marry, and, and he does marry them. Uh, Thingol and Baron organize this, uh, the hunting of the beast, where they realize they've got to get Karkaroth out of Doriath before it kills anybody else. And along with the other great captains of Doriath, they attempt to kill the beast. Uh, they find it one day, drinking by the stream, and it attacks and mauls Baron. Uh, Juan does his epic leap in slow motion onto Karkaroth. They have a great fight. Juan slays Karkaroth, but is mortally poisoned and wounded in the doing so. This is the third time. He's allowed to speak three times before he dies. Uh, we're not... We don't get the quotes for the first or the third one, but he does talk in the middle. Um, so he does basically says farewell to Baron. It's very sad. Uh, they cut the Silmaril from the wolf's belly, and they give it to Thingol, so Thingol does get the Silmarillion. Baron is then brought back with Juan, and they're buried, um, but before he dies, Luthien asks Baron to wait for her beyond the Western Sea. Baron then dies, goes to the halls of Mandos, which I believe men are not supposed to go to, but he, because their love was so strong, he does wait there for her. Um, and then Luthien kind of fades. Uh, she basically does what um, Feanor's wife did in Valinor, that's at least how I picture it, where her spirit dies, and her body right. kind of just wastes um, so her spirit goes to Mandos. She begs to be reunited with Baron, but Mandos says it's not within his power. He then they go to Manwe, who is moved by her and gives Luthien a choice. She can either stay dead, but go to Valimar and, or I guess, be reborn in Valimar and live among the elves in, in happiness forever, but without Baron. Or she can return with Baron to Middle Earth, but she would basically just be mortal. They'd round her ears, and she would just be human. Um, so she chooses the second. Baron and Luthien return to Middle Earth, live in peace, and have some measure of happiness for a time. So that's where it ends. Huh. And never was a sadder tale told of Baron and her. Sorry, yeah. Luthien and her Baron. Baron? I meant Luthien. I was trying to do the whole Shakespeare thing, but of course I didn't write it. Uh, <laughs> whoa, yeah, lots so of whoa. They, so they get the files ready to, you know, get some of, so, you know, save her years, years off or something. I mean, just, just the tips, just the tips. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Must be painful. So I, I actually uh, have the quote here. For the spirit of Baron, at her bidding, tarried in the halls of Mandos, unwilling to leave the world, until Luthien came to say her last farewell upon the dim shores of the outer sea. Aww. Um, yeah, I kind of like because we're anytime we get. I mean, a description... I could go on, but it's like four more paragraphs. Oh no, no, like... I get it. But like, the, I've you know they picture the halls of Mandos are like in the absolute most eastern part of the land of Amun, and then there's the outer sea. So he's basically like on the beach as far west as you can possibly go, and he's he's waiting for her there. But yeah, their love their love was so was so strong that he uh, he and he could not uh, could not leave without her. We don't know what happened to her. And more. and she changed her whole outlook from just like hanging out with Mandos to I don't know what happens to mortals when they die. Yeah, weird. And she actually makes uh, Mandos get the feels as well with her singing. Oh yeah, she she does sing a good song to him. Yeah, but he didn't want to like rape her or anything. He was just impressed. No. Because he's good. Either way, she's a great singer. She has made people that had ulterior motives do the exact opposite. Yeah, she's the Shakira of this world. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> her hips don't lie. <laughs> God damn it. I hate myself well, for um, just saying that. Yeah. I mean, just sad. Like, if they ever the made this into a movie, if they ever made this into a movie, like, there were lots of people walking out because the dog dies. Yeah, but you get a lot of like it's, it's bad the dogs. Yeah, it, yeah. I think it would make a great musical. Uh, <laughs> There's plenty yeah. of songs, but very few words. <laughs> Boomer will not live, um, which is sad. Um, but she sings beautifully, but she also makes everybody fall asleep. So you wouldn't remember the whole, the end of any of the songs. Yeah. What, what what is striking to me is that this is like a lot like the hunt hunt for the beast of the Givaudan, basically. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. That's, that's they what they compared huge, it to. Huge beast that you know mauled some children to death, and uh, 
um, basically, I mean, according to legend, they hunted it down and and yeah, killed it. So it's I was yeah. being sarcastic. Do you actually know what he's talking about, Matt? Uh, yes. Okay, yes. I, uh, I apologize uh, that the... I was being sarcastic. I was like, yeah, of course, the oh. beast of je, je, je. I knew that. Je Vaudan. Je Vaudan. No, you don't know Je Vaudan? I do not know no, Je Vaudan. I've never heard of it. Also, uh, the quest for three hairs. So the beast for uh, whatever, the je Parisian thing. Was... It's, a friend, it's, a, it's in France, actually. Right. Parisian, right? Those were the wolves that came in at like 1400 or something like that. Oh, yeah, it could be, yeah. And so ba basically, I think it was around the revolution. Anyway, uh, a bunch of wolves invaded uh, Paris, and because the French are the French, okay, I waited yeah, for a reaction. <laughs> <laughs> they're very brave. Um, yeah, so they just had this like big hunt out for them. 1764. And... There we go. There we go. But no, what I was talking about was something else completely. <laughs> okay. Okay. Go on, people talk. Yeah. So, so I mean, I, I just know the the rough edges of the of the legend. So it's like, yeah, this there was a big wolf that people thought, you know, uh, hunted uh, hunted down because they they it attacked humans, and so it's like, yeah, they had to hunt it down. And then, I mean, there were trials, I think, as well, like because it's like people were thinking of witchcraft or something like that as well. Oh, I'm sure. Um, it's a yeah, people people actually thought it was a werewolf, like yeah. legit werewolf. Yeah, but you have lots of werewolf trials anyway. It's yeah, good to know there's a historical context for uh, for Karkaroth. Do you think Darren's uh, chilling out where the blue wizards are? Because <laughs> he could be. <laughs> Probably they, they, they just got killed at some point when you mm -hmm. know went to Mandos, but not at this point. Um, I don't even know what the blue wizards were before they. Took the form of the blue wizards. Of the blue wizards, like they were all Maya, basically. It's mm. it's weird. We we know that Lauren is Gandalf. Saruman had a different name as well. Kurinir. Kurinir, yeah, yes, that's it. Yeah. Well, Kuru um, was like the. It just it means like crafty. You know, that seems to be like the prefix given to a lot of the uh, the crafty. Yeah. People. So so for crafty, read dick. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Can we just say how much this is like? I mean, is our uh, is is Arwen uh, and Ar Arwen and uh, and Aragorn basically like Beren and Luthien light, or are they not? It's like well, it's weird. I don't know how you read it. Like I assume most people read read about them before they read the Silmarillion, and you don't. I mean, the movies it's played up much more their relationship of you know giving up immortality for for uh, you know a, a time of, of love, but it uh, this is the first time it happened, and it it's weird. I it always weird to me that. Uh, Thingol right off the bat wasn't like no you're a man of course you can't like that was never brought up it was more like it was like it's a possibility but like like they were okay it, they're two different species like it's not did anyone else feel like they should have been more of an uproar like oh my god this is an unheard of thing or like it was like eh, it's okay like they're about to make a Zors we don't marry it's way uh, well <laughs> it, it, it's not unheard of because Melian and Thingol are already together yeah. Well, and I think it's, 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 sort of a, it's sort of a pattern that gets uh, repeated through his history. I mean, mm -hmm. it does get it does sort of get lesser and less uh, like the multitude of because a lot of guys marry up, um, so like really awesome birds. Oh, so birds. That's the birds. great. Eagles. No, that's great. No, birds is um, like slang for. I figured it out. <laughs> yeah. But this is—it's only happened three times in the whole history of the world, right? There's Baron Luthien, Aragorn, and um, oh, and and then there's Tuor and Idris. I can never. Tuor and Idris. Idris, right? Is Idris? Yeah, and uh, Tuor and Idris, Idris? Elba. Okay. Idris. Kaylee and Tario. Let's but yeah, not I, 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 mean, I, I, I have to say that I still stick with Aragorn, though. Aragorn has a much, probably a, a much more epic story, I guess, uh, because. He has to fight in in lots of wars, basically. Whereas Baron, basically, it yeah, comes from the wilderness. But like Baron, no, but he took on like the boss. Like Aragorn never even comes. I mean, he does battle with Sauron, like in the Palantir, the Battle of Wills, you know. But like, I'm yeah. pretty sure Baron had a much harder. It was a shorter yeah. road, but it, it was a, a shorter time at least, but a much harder road. Oh, yeah, I can see that. Mm. Still, it's it's to me, it's like. I mean, I I like the fact that they pulled this stuff. Uh, from the Silmarillion and you know made it more made it clearer in the the Lord of the Rings from a, from Salad anyway because it's um, I mean it's nice subtext anyway and it's like the same thing happens with uh, with um, Elrond basically because Elrond doesn't want Aragorn to marry Arwen un until he becomes yes. the king of, king of Gondor basically mm. it's like elf uh, you know elf dads just dicks 
Yeah, but I think I think Elrond's a little bit smarter because he they're all actually related, mm-hmm. well descended from those yeah. two. Yes, yeah, um, because he, he's probably a little bit white because his his mum and dad were like a, a pairing as well. It was weird because yeah, because um, like Arendel Arendel's like half man, half elf, and he yeah. married an elf. Yeah, well. right. So there's that that guy as well. What also got mentioned in the film, in the extended version of the Two Towers, was the Ring of Barahir, basically. Yeah, I did like mm. that, where you, you you actually got a little throwback. I like any time something popped up from the first age, like even when, when I think, I don't know if it was in the extended edition, where um, Legolas mentions a Balrog of Morgoth. It's like, oh, Morgoth got mentioned. I like that. And then Galadriel <laughs> yes. did that again in, in the Hobbit movie. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, important to note that like this is the beginning of basically all the important characters that we know from Yarendil, Elwing, all the way down to Elrond and, and to Arwen. And uh, just the last the last paragraph of the chapter is where he says, uh, he's talking about the choices. This doom she chose, forsaking the Blessed Realm and putting aside all claim to kinship with those that dwelt there. Um, so it was that alone of the Eldali she had died indeed and left the world long ago. Yet in her choice, the two kindreds have been joined. And she is the forerunner of, of many in whom the Eldar see yet, though all the world is changed and the likeness of Luthien, the beloved, whom they have lost. Yeah, so that's yeah. pretty much the end of the story proper. Um, I just had a couple like quick questions. Um, I felt like Darren get kind of got a bad rap in the story because he's you know he sees them and he tattles on them. But when we find out that he basically once he found out that Baron, that Luthien left, where he he kind of just like goes east and and wanders, you know, he couldn't even live around her anymore. Like I, I kind of mm. warmed up yeah. to him a little bit after that. Like he wasn't like mm. the uh, the dicky like he's not like Maglin or, or you know a real no, dicky no. elf. He's a, he's a little bit creepy at the beginning when he's so spying. I like to think he wasn't like actually spying, like he just was walking through the woods. No, oh, yeah, it's just like you know, but it's it's fine because he he sort of got better as the story went along. So he's still you know making poetry even if it's just for himself. Yeah, about last love. Yeah, it's good first thing. I mean, there was no chance. I mean, he's like the uh, what's what you say? Um, he, yeah, he's friend zoned forever. He's like the Jorah moment of this story. <laughs> <laughs> At least Jorah got a kiss. He didn't even get a kiss. No, but he could write poetry. Jorah couldn't write poetry. Oh, the bards of Bear Island are known for their their, their poems. Right? <laughs> Isn't that, we, we find that out. The bear, the bear, the maiden fair. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. They wrote half the songs in Westeros. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The only other kind of question I had was... Um, a lot over the years, Christopher Tolkien has sort of gone back and, and re-edited and, and issued standalone volumes of a lot of Tolkien's work. He did it with the Children of Huron and some of his shorter shorter stories. And I always thought that this would be the perfect you know story to read because it's kind of a self-contained story. And a lot of fans of the genre know it from references to Baron Luthien over the years, but he hasn't done it. So like, There's a book. What's that? There's a book that I have, which is like the the whole poem, like it's, oh, the, it's oh, oh, the poem, like the the verse, the verse yeah. version. The Days of Valerie, and it's mm-hmm. called. So yeah, it's uh, one of the history of Middle Earth two does okay books. There's like eight of them. Right, I was I always was kind of confused about that whole because they show like earlier versions of what what eventually became, and I I don't like I don't want to know nine different versions of it before. Like there's all this other stuff about more battles and stuff that was cut out of the Silmarillion, but. You know, like a, a prose version. Like I, th- I thought people would be open to like an actual prose version, as he did with the Children of Huron. I would read it. Well, I, 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 so it depends I. on it depends on what form he Tolkien actually wrote the stuff. Because I don't, I don't think Christopher Tolkien would actually write it from. Square. Yeah, no, I, well, just, I mean, feel like he had hundreds of pages to work with, and he ended up with like these fifty pages, and he had to always pick and choose what stayed and, and what didn't. But we're yeah. led to believe that Tolkien did write it at least in verse form, which I, I guess you said it is in one of the uh, the histories of Middle Earth. And yeah. it's also it's... in Aragon sings some of it, but mm-hmm. it's like, ah, uh, well, there's a lot more, and blah blah blah. He sang it in verse. Oh no, I thought you were going to start like... singing it. It's like, yeah, that's how it starts. Yeah, blah, blah. So, go ahead. Blah blah. blah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just like because I have I have the book uh, Lays of Bellerian and basically it has like it's 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 not really a story it's like you know it's commentary so there's like passages of the poem and then I mean it's very dense it's just like a very very I mean I I can I can tell you how many verses oh, there are. it's like like four thousand lines or something. Oh no! Go ahead, read them. That's fine. We'll wait. <laughs> no, 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 uh, a king there was in days of old, ere men yet walked upon the mould. His power was reared in cavern shade, his hands was over glen and glade. Of leaves his crown and mantle, his mantle green, his silver lances long and keen. The starlight in his shield was caught, ere moon was made and the sun was wrought. And it goes on, like that. So who's he talking about there? Uh, on that, he's talking about Thingol. Okay. And then um, at the end of that, like 
30 lines or whatever. He's just like, um, da, 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 yeah, um, just mentions Luthien and then just goes on from there. I might pick that up. I just I've always been intimidated by them, like as a whole. But uh, I know there was a lot of really good like Easter eggs and, and you know bits that became more complete later on. All right, so I think that wraps up the the discussion proper. Uh, thank you for sticking with us, and hope you found this as enlightening as as, as we did. Um, you can stick around for a short after show if you'd like. But uh, that's it for the show proper. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Bye everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yo, B, yo, Dill, it's time to get ill. Yo, light up the mic like a Silmaril. So this is supposed to be a kind of a Valentine show, too, because, you know, Baron and Luthien, like, their love, you know, made them do all this stuff. And, yeah, and the, his tombstone is Baron, and his wife's tombstone says Luthien. Like, that's very sweet. It is. Valentine, Baron Luthien. Uh, so, yeah. What else is there to say? It's it's like the the power couple. Go yeah, for they're it. The, they're the <laughs> ones that everyone's compared to now, all all down through the ages. Um, yeah, even they even mention it like at the end the way they say like and then in the future like the people of their line would resemble Luthien. Did anyone want to mention your favorite Lord of the Rings pickup lines in honor of Valentine's Day and Baron and Luthien? Gotta put a ring on it. No, if if you. <laughs> oh, like, I like that. If you want this, you gotta put a ring on it. Put it's a, like I would put say a, put a silver on it is more like <laughs> it's just like the, the Lord of the Rings Hobbit similarly and all into one. Yeah, just I mean don't buy jewelry probably that would be another one. Just you know don't don't get jewelry. It it it, it will curse you. That was the one I put in the uh, I thought up and put it in the uh, forum. I need I need uh, is Alex still here? Yes. All right. Can you can you play the the girl? Okay. Oh. All you all you have to say is pretty much yes. So, uh, okay. <laughs> hey girl, do you want to be my ent wife? Sure. And I never saw her again. There's <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably a Tom Bombadil joke in there somewhere, but I don't show, I'm not sure I want to be, no, I want to be the one to make it. Um, oh no, just mention hi Ding Dongadillo anytime you're trying to pick someone up and you'll, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to suck my hi Ding and Dingle over here? <laughs> Get your yellow boots out of here. He got Goldberry, uh, so he must have some game, right? It's like, oh, oh, it, but he stole her from the river. <laughs> Everyone's stealing everyone's <laughs> daughters. Like, mm. <laughs> but they're Myers, so he can. That's right. But Eowyn, yeah. for example, if Eowyn and Arwen meet, meet like Eowyn, I am no man, but I'm still be into you. Uh, hang on, are you know, shipping Eowyn like and all? Yeah, I, I didn't know that that was a theory end. out there. <laughs> but she, I, she I, wanted know, to fight like a man, know. but I'm pretty sure she was still into Aragorn. <laughs> I don't know. Well, Faramir was pretty smooth. Like what? How 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 is it? No, he was super smooth. Okay. Isn't how, that another how instance of like them falling in love while one of them's asleep, where he's passed out, and she like, fall, you know, he was so fair to look on, and but he had uh, actually Sam and Frodo. Yeah, that too. But well, that's... That was, that's like brothers in combat love, right? Yeah, not for a large section of the internet though. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I told you about that damn Tolkien erotica site I found with all Valar inspired erotica. Apparently, oh, Tolkien, oh Jesus! Tolkien, I Tell told you about this whole thread about Tolkien and uh, Orome. They're boyfriends, but they love to watch football. But like, anytime they watch a football game, like they get into it and they start to wrestling, and the wrestling leads to other stuff. Oh my god! <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm never gonna be able to watch the uh, Super Bowl again. <laughs> so, uh, you know those like inspirational posters where it's like you know, like. It, so there's uh, one for MMA, and this one guy's like trying to choke out this other guy, and the inspiration is it's only gay if you make eye contact. <laughs> Can we give the baddies a, uh, a pickup line, or do they only have bad ones that don't work? Well, we don't really have any instances of a successful baddie relationship. I mean, Mor- <laughs> Morgoth and Ungoliant <laughs> for a little while. <laughs> Morgoth and Ungoliant, they're the. They're... Divorcing couple. It's like uh, after an unhappy marriage. Well, sure, when I, you try to eat your spouse, it usually doesn't end well. I mean, unless you're yeah, I mean that's what she tries to do. That's that's just love, you know. That's just her, her. That's just her way of showing love. I'm not sure. So a tower top by an eye, is that like supposed to be a dick? <laughs> I don't know. It's like I mean, I've been I've been told by by uh, some people who've watched the, the movies that they think like a Sauron's eye looks like a big sky gyna. Uh, <laughs> on that note thank you for joining us <laughs>
We'll end with the sky gina. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> well done. If the tower is what I think it is, and there's a... Oh, so Tolkien a... did not do allegory. It's not a penis. It's just a tower. <laughs> okay. It's not this isn't miss... C.S. Lewis. This isn't a Disney and he... movie. And these <laughs> missiles are not shaped like... like... That's just know. for This is not Little Mermaid. <laughs> it's not the Lion King either, where this... this... Or we Aladdin, had... or any of them. Yeah, they yeah. all got some disrunk, disgruntled uh, animators at, at several points in their history. Oh, yeah. I mean, would you want to see an animated film about the Silmarillion, though? They made one for I, each other film, for each other book, so at some point. I think a good try. animated film about this book would be amazing. When they made like the animated Bilbo Baggins film, it would be awful. <laughs> yeah, the great. If everyone's like round. Adventure. It's. I mean, I can't get this. You get Leonard Nimoy singing anything during an animated <laughs> film. Bilbo, Bilbo Baggins. <laughs> Greatest little, the greatest little hobbit. That, that, that was like that was that was nothing to do with the um, cartoon. It was just like a song well, you a wanted song. to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I thought that was like in the background of the. Oh know, no! Like the, the, the songs in the actual animated series are actually quite catchy, and they stick with you. You know, the whole twelve little birds and and five fur trees. That was all stuck in my head for quite some time. Or three fur trees, I forget. But yeah, but that movie I, also terrified. Where there's me, where there's a whip, there's a way. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's probably tra la la tra la 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 all in the valley. That's probably that, yeah. that's probably playing on, there you go. on loop in each animated studio. Like you know, where there's a whip, there's, there's a way. A way. <laughs> but it's. I mean, I would be fine with an animated film about this if it were hand drawn because I can't stand CG animation. Sadly, most of the time. Yo, B, yo, Dil, it's time to get you. Yo, light up the mic like a Silmaril. I just have a question, like about the curse, because I don't think actually the curse has any any real power. Basically, it's just like they make yeah, it happen. No, no curse. Ha it's all in the believing of it. That's that's yeah. the whole thing. That it's once it's out there, people talk about it, and it, it like it's, you said, it was yeah, it's like the whole Huan thing. It's like if he yeah. if they didn't know there was that prophecy, would they go at him in the shape of giant wolves? No, right. and Huan would probably not seek out uh, giant wolves to fight with. Yeah. But at the same time, like he's also protected by plot armor because none of them is the greatest wolf ever, <laughs> right? Yeah, but that's where Saruman was trying to like play the literal game again. Like, well, if I become the greatest wolf, then I can kill him, but it doesn't work that way. No, because he's not actually a wolf. We forgot to mention that. I mean, I, it's probably because he's not in a, a wolf by nature, so he, he just took the shape of one. So he's probably not able to kill him anyway. It's like, yeah, you just took the appearance of a wolf. You are not actually a wolf. Oh, boy. Yeah, again, semantics, but he uses them as well. Like, you know, I'm, you know, that, that's where the semantics hurt him when when he used them to hurt others again in the beginning. So, yeah, you know, karma is a bitch. Yo, B, yo, Dil, it's time to get you. Yo, light up the mic like a Silmaril. There are some, some notes that we have after the official summaries. Um, you, you just, someone wrote in red, like, how about a fun game? How would Peter Jackson ruin this bit? Oh yeah, was yeah. I was thinking did? about the uh, song, the song, the epic rap battle they have. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> like a singer. <laughs> oh, you'd just probably turn it into a sword fight and some ridiculous. There would be lasers. Anti gravity it, stuff. Yeah, there would be CGI. Would be like, 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 or like, like, <laughs> they would like talk talk at each other like like Galadriel in the movie and have weird and and, then, and they go all blue and faces. stuff. Yeah. There's an animated film that's that's come out now. It's called Strange Magic by George oh, Lucas, yeah. and it's awful. And the the I mean, sometimes the the characters I think when they when they want to express something, they they say it in song. Uh, and there's a battle between the the body and the uh, protagonist, and they basically they say, just sing at each other while they're sword fighting. It's like it, the weirdest thing. Uh... That isn't yeah. actually by George Lucas. He wrote. He had well, he produced credits, it. and he he's... produced it. But yeah. it's, you know, it's still. I mean, I there, think he a, also a... produced Howard the Duck. So come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's turned up in Guardians of the Galaxy. And it's going to be awesome. Yeah, people love them in that. That's gonna. They're re they're redoing Howard the Duck. Uh, they're like rebooting the whole comic version of yeah. that. So I'm sure there's a movie down the road at some point. Really? Oh. I'm not interested at all. And in, I mean, if he ends up like. Eating uh, an infinity gem that that would be awesome, but it's I don't know. Just no, like, I, I, I wouldn't like, like a, a, I wouldn't like a Howard the Duck movie. I probably maybe one of the like the one shots they do. 
as like a fun little thing, but probably not a movie. I mean, it worked as an after credit sequence, but not as yeah. a whole movie, I think. Um. Yo, B, yo, Dill, it's time to get you. Yo, light up the mic like a Silmaril. And when we, uh, just a side note, when we, we had a puppy, uh, when I read this like six years ago and I tried to convince my parents to name it Juan, but my, my dad kept thought it was Juan. Like it sounded like he was saying Juan every time he called the dog. So <laughs> oh, he ended up just calling him Duke. <laughs> but I, uh, I tried. Yeah. In German, we just say like Juan, the, you know, the In Spanish, we call it Juan. <laughs> Juan. <laughs> Juan, that dog. <laughs> Yo, B, yo, Dill, it's time to get you. Like a Silmaril. Well, you could say Thor's hand. It's like, yeah, that's more accurate because um, Fenrir bites off Thor's hand as they bind him with chains in North, uh, North mythology, anyway. Because they, I mean, once Loki gives birth to Fenrir and the Midgard Serpent um, and, her, and Hale, they sort of, the Northern, the North, the Norse gods feel that they have to uh, bind the, the wolf with a chain made of, uh, made by, by dwarves, basically. Um, because he's able to basically get out of all the chains that they that they put him in, put put him in, and so um, he says, "Well, okay, I'm gonna let you bind me, but uh, Thor has to put his hand in my uh, in my mouth. So you know, if anything weird happens, I'm gonna get his hand." And so yeah, once he can't get out, he sort of bites Thor's hand off, and that's how it goes. And well, this is spoiler alert for like Marvel yeah. movie in like, yeah. 2019. <laughs> uh, Yo, B, do. It's time to get you. So this is going to be released on Valentine's Day then? Around uh, then. Two should weeks we try to so. make it like more romantic like right now? Like, this is what <laughs> Lucian did for Baron. Happy Valentine's Day. Yeah, have a hand. I, I, I think oh. you just did. <laughs> oh, all right. It's like probably some some hearts, red and and pink I don't know imagery like like or, you you could use the Bolton banners for that one. If yeah, you can't be work. with the one <laughs> you really, love, it's really Valentine's. Then grow your hair down, save his ass, help him like fulfill his destiny, you know, and then he'll eventually die, and then you know you'll be you'll love the one you would. Because they essentially they skin the wolf and the bat, so it's like they they already they're probably really really friendly with Boltons if they if they ever come across them, I guess. It's like, yay, we, we know how you roll. Just in case they ever meet any other fictional characters from an entirely yes. other fictional universe, they'll be all right. Yes. <laughs> all right. It's all fan fiction. All right. Take it easy, guys. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. Good to podcast with you, hey. uh, Eddie yeah, and Alex again. Yeah, Eddie, it's great yeah. to meet you. Yeah, good to meet you. That was fun. Oh, right. uh, wonderful. Everyone got to meet each other. It's like, um, we. I mean, I'm a big hug fest. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, Yay. and we're gonna keep that in for Valentine's Day. So. Yes, big Skype hug for everybody. Yeah. Aww. 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 There we go. We just made it romantic. <laughs> Yay! Aww. All right. Good night, guys. All right. Good night. Bye, Bye. guys. Bye.